Every civilization in world history has had a golden age, a peak where its cultural, economic and military might was considered the benchmark by which all other nations were compared. For Rome, this was the age of Augustus, while for Islam it was the Abbasid Caliphate. In this video, we will be exploring the zenith of ancient China, the rise of the Han Dynasty and the reign of its greatest emperor, Han Wudi. In our opinion, learning new stuff and developing yourself is an essential part of being a human. In our fast-paced world, it's often difficult to find enough time though, as our work, social lives and hobbies take most of our time. It's natural to think you don't have enough time to read a book, but the sponsor of this video, Blinkist, is here to help you with that problem. This is a unique app that takes the most important insights, new developments and know-how from thousands of non-fiction books condensing them into a 15 minute long read or listen. As we have to work almost 24 seven to produce our videos, Blinkist is essential for our personal growth. If you want to learn more about Confucius, who features heavily in this video, you should listen to Great Thinkers by Alain de Bouton, while China in 10 Words by Yu Hua explores the way modern China talks about itself and probes what that tells us about its past, present and likely future. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash Kings and Generals are going to get unlimited access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. The earliest Chinese civilization emerged in the basins of the Yellow and Yangtze rivers around the second millennium BC, forming into the early dynasties of the Xia, Shang and Zhou before dissolving into warring petty kingdoms in an era known as the Spring and Autumn period. Despite controlling only a fraction of modern China, these states were the originators of many pillars of Chinese culture, including the philosophies of Taoism, Legalism, Confucianism, and the earliest form of the Chinese script. In 221 BC, Qing Shi Huang's fierce army not only united the kingdoms of Spring and Autumn, but also pushed beyond the traditional Yangtze heartland, conquering the so-called barbarians of the south. Qin Shi Huang is remembered today as the first emperor of a united Chinese nation. However, his rule was brutal, and as a result, his empire quickly disintegrated after his death, having lasted only 15 years. Out of the turmoil rose the warlord Liu Bang, king of Han, who reunited most of the Middle Kingdom under one banner. In 202 BC, the Han Dynasty had been born, and with it, the beginning of the Golden Age of Classical China. The new dynasty had major obstacles to overcome. To the north it had powerful enemies, the Xiongnu, a fiercely warlike confederation of nomadic horsemen who inhabited a vast territory across the northern Eurasian steppe who are believed to be the ancestors of the vicious Attila who would ravage the Roman Empire six centuries later. In 200 BC, they thundered southwards, besieging the Chinese city of Taiwan. Liu Bang, now the Gaozu Emperor, personally led an army of 300,000 to confront the invaders, but the Han forces were handily crushed by the nomadic horse archers and the Emperor was nearly captured. After this, the Han operated on a policy of placation, offering the northern nomads exorbitant tributes of rice, silks, wine and women. This kept the peace for a time, but Xiongnu raids continued. To the south were the skilled seafarers of the Hundred Yue, an agglomeration of tribes consolidated into the kingdoms of Minyue and Nanyue. Briefly ruled by the Qin, they had never been reconquered by the Han. The peoples here were not Chinese. They cut their hair short, tattooed their whole bodies, and spoke a variety of languages which were probably more closely related to modern Vietnamese, Thai and Malay than classical Chinese. They were fiercely independent and had ambitions of their own. The Han Dynasty also was highly decentralized, with much of the eastern half dominated by ten kingdoms who had their own armies, taxes and laws. Through conspiracy and political maneuvering, the Gaozu Emperor managed to replace most of these kings with members of the imperial family to ensure their loyalty to the government in Chang'an. Still, the vassal kingdoms were prone to sedition, and in 154 BC, 
the emperor's nephew, the King of Wu, orchestrated a rebellion of seven states. While the insurgents were crushed, it became evident that unless the imperial court in Chang'an could impose centralized rule upon their vassal kings, more rebellions would happen. Perhaps the most existential problem the Han dynasty faced was cultural. Here we must turn back the clock and tell the story of Confucius. Born amidst the states of the spring and autumn period, the seminal philosopher despised the petty rulers of his time yearning instead for a world where kings ruled by sagely virtue and not through military might. He devised many precepts by which society could be guided by moral example, tradition, and devotion to family and community. Although his teachings spread among many, the petty kings had little interest in his ideas. Building a kingdom around them was impractical when it was soldiers that would prevent it from being eaten up by its warlike neighbors. This attitude was distilled in Qin Shi Huang, who established the strict and ruthless tenets of legalism as the official form of social control in the Qin dynasty. To him, moral philosophers had no place in an empire that had been won by the sword, a policy he made clear through the burning of Confucian books and exile of Confucian teachers. The Gaozu Emperor asked the same question. All I possess I have won on horseback. Why should I bother with the Book of Odes and Book of History? To this, his closest advisor replied, Your Majesty may have won the empire on horseback, but can you rule it on horseback? The Han Emperor saw merit in these words. A warrior king could conquer an empire, but it took a sage king to keep it. Wanting to avoid the mistakes of the short-lived Qin, he softened his stance towards Confucianism. Even then, the seminal philosopher's legacy still competed with legalism, Taoism and others to be China's dominant worldview. So early Han China was an empire divided, externally threatened, and culturally unsure of itself. It would take an emperor of unparalleled will and ambition to solve this, and such an emperor was soon to be born. In 156 BC, a young prince named Liu Chu came into the world, the 11th son of Emperor Jing of Han. His birth was precipitated by Holy Omen. According to legend, his mother had received a vision while pregnant with him, dreaming of a bright sun falling into her womb. Furthermore, the day he was born happened to be the same day that his father ascended onto the imperial throne. These auspicious signs delighted the emperor, who quickly singled out Liu Chu as his favorite son, declaring him heir apparent at the age of nine. In 141, the Jingdi emperor grew ill and passed away. Thus, at the tender age of 16, Liu Chu ascended onto the dragon throne, becoming known as Han Wu Di, Emperor Wu of Han. True to the shining prophecy under which he'd been born, Emperor Wu would become perhaps the greatest reformer, conqueror, and cultural father of Chinese history. The first thing Wu Di tackled upon his ascension to the throne was the issue of culture and philosophy. The young emperor was faced with the same question. Should a nation be governed internally by military discipline or by moral integrity? In the first year of his reign, Wu Di banished the precepts of Qin legalism, declaring that Confucian virtues were the principal philosophy by which his empire would be run. The young emperor sacked all non-Confucians from his service, while giving Confucian scholars a privileged place in his imperial court. In 136 BC, Wu Di established the five literary masterpieces of Confucius as the principal pillars of state-sponsored education and in 124 BC opened the Imperial Academy, where all prospective government officials were given a standard education in the Confucian classics, ensuring that the diplomats, governors, and other bureaucrats would be united under the same code of ethics and social organization. The Academy also served as the basis of the Imperial Civil Service Exam, which would become the backbone of bureaucracy of later Chinese dynasties. This decision cannot be understated. The five Confucian classics, which taught people how to live, love, and lead, more or less became the official scripture of the Han Empire, 
the closest the Chinese-speaking world would ever come to an equivalent of the Bible or the Quran. Just as Emperor Constantine would transform the Roman Empire by establishing Christianity as its premier faith, so too did Wu Di transform China by embracing Confucius. Wu Di's next goal was the centralization of his internally fragmented empire. He curtailed the powers of the nobles in his court, most of whom were related to the emperor and considered themselves above the law, and also targeted the vassal kings, seeking to remove their troublesome autonomy once and for all by taking away their ability to levy taxes, reserving that power for the central government alone. Naturally, Wu Di's reforms were deeply unpopular with the aristocracy, whose privileges were diminished. Their leader was Wu Di's grandmother, the Grand Empress Dowager Dou, an obstinate old woman who believed her grandson's rash policies would bring about their doom. Knowing that nearly his entire court was against him, Emperor Wu displayed immaculate cunning. His grandmother's influence permeated every level of the imperial palace, so he secretly recruited a circle of young loyal supporters from among the commoners, giving them low-level, inconspicuous positions in the court where they could act on the emperor's behalf under the noses of the nobles. The political tides turned in 135 BC, when Dowager Do passed away. Now leaderless, the nobles were powerless to stop Wu Di from expelling them out of the capital and replacing them with the young and loyal inside a court that the emperor had been grooming for years. With this insolence quelled, Wu Di moved on to the vassal kingdoms. In 127 BC, he declared that all kings had to split the inheritance of their realm equally between all their sons. This was a brilliant play at divide and conquer. It made their kingdoms smaller, weaker, and easier for the imperial government to impose total control over. In the end, Wu Di succeeded in passing all his reforms, transforming the Han dynasty from a loose confederation into a centralized empire. Perhaps the most enduring legacy of Emperor Wu is the territorial expansions accomplished under his reign. Previous Han emperors had been decidedly non-imperialistic. After all, War was expensive. Feeding, arming and transporting armies that often numbered in the hundreds of thousands was a monumental feat that put a massive drain on China's agrarian economy. Wu Di, however, was far more ambitious. To counteract the costs, he completely monopolized the production of China's salt and iron, the two most profitable industries in the nation. Furthermore, he standardized the price of grain and nationalized the minting of coins. These policies were considered downright tyrannical by farmers and merchants, but it allowed the celestial monarch to field army after army. The first target was the troublesome Xiongnu, who were placated with wine and silk for decades. In 133 BC, Wu Di officially ended the tributes and launched the first of many campaigns aimed to subdue the troublesome horse lords for good. The Northwoods March was a brutal struggle of attrition, with battle after battle causing the loss of both Xiongnu and Han lives in the hundreds of thousands. However, due to the leadership of brilliant generals like Wei Qin and Huo Chubing, Han forces were able to finally make significant gains against the northern nomads, annexing the Hershey Corridor for the empire by 121 BC. In 119 BC, Han forces massacred 90,000 Xiongnu soldiers at the Battle of Mobei, driving the nomads north into the Gobi Desert. Wu Di settled these lands with 700,000 Chinese colonists, securing it as part of the Han cultural sphere. As Wu Di's forces pushed their northern frontier, the south had become equally volatile. The kingdoms of the Baiyue people had long seen the Han Chinese to their north as foreign interlopers, and relations between the two were complicated. For one, the kingdom of Nanyue was ruled by the House of Zhao, a line of Chinese kings that had assimilated into the local culture. Furthermore, the southern states were more prone to fighting one another than the Chinese. In fact, when Minyue had invaded Nanyue in 138 BC, 
The latter had submitted to the Han, becoming an imperial protectorate. However, Nan Yu's sentiments towards their northern overlords would soon turn sour. In 112 BC, the native prime minister Lu Jia assassinated his pro-Han king Zhao Xing and rebelled against the empire. Ruthless in response, Wu Di dispatched an army of 100,000, crushed the southern Yue in battle, and captured and executed Lu Jia and his puppet king. This show of brutal force terrified the kingdom of Min Yue, and their king, Yu Shan, launched a preemptive attack upon Han territory. However, realizing that all this accomplished was to poke the proverbial bear, Yu Shan's advisors performed a coup, executed him, and surrendered to the Han. Awed by these events, the kingdoms of Yulang and Dian submitted to Han rule willingly and became client states. The south was a profitable conquest for Wu Di, for the region's goods, such as pearls, peacocks, and elephant tusks, provided luxuries for the Han aristocracy, while its coastal regions boosted the empire's economy through naval trade. In order to establish total control, Emperor Wu was ruthless and decisive. The kingdom of Nan Yue was split into nine counties, each ruled by a Han official. Min Yue, meanwhile, was an ungovernable land by virtue of its narrow, mountainous territory. As a result, Wu Di ordered his army to commit a mass deportation of the peoples there, forcing them from their homes and resettling them between the Changjian and Huai rivers, leaving the land completely depopulated. Henceforth, the lands of the south would be increasingly assimilated into Han Chinese culture. Today, the southern provinces of Fujian and Guangdong are overwhelmingly Chinese-speaking. In 109 BC, a breakdown in relations between the Han Empire and Uzhou, king of Gojoseon, led to the latter executing a Han envoy. Infuriated, Han Wudi used this as a pretext for war, annexing the northern tip of the Korean peninsula. This began an era of Chinese political dominance over Korea. Meanwhile, back in 128 BC, the Chinese diplomat Zhang Chen had embarked on a long trek westwards to find allies against the Xiongnu. There he came into contact with the great civilizations of Central Asia, the sophisticated city-states of the red-haired Tocharians, and the Hellenized kingdoms of Fagana and Bactria. We have already covered this fateful meeting between the Greek and Chinese worlds in another video, and won't dive too deep into it again. Suffice to say, by 102 BC, the armies of Wu Di had established their dominance across the Taklamakan Desert and into Fergana, and had the heavenly horses to show for it. The Emperor established Han military outposts in many of the region's cities to ensure their loyalty. The increased stability brought to the region by the Han allowed for the establishment of the Silk Road. This had several major consequences, namely the introduction of Buddhism to China and the introduction of Chinese luxuries to the people of Europe, whose colonial empires would come knocking on the Middle Kingdom's gates centuries later. By 100 BC, Wu Di's constant campaigns had caught up with him. Peasant revolts had erupted throughout the realm, and while ultimately quelled, the realm's main problem lay in the imperial court itself. The emperor's palace had become bitterly divided between two families, the Wei and the Li. Wu Di's empress and his heir apparent, Prince Ju, belonged to the Wei bloodline. However, the Li bloodline, also related to the emperor, was incredibly influential and sought to take control of the succession. In 91 BC, Zhang Chong used his clout with the emperor to accuse the crown prince Zhu of committing witchcraft to sabotage his father's health. The young prince reacted rashly. Fearing that his father would believe the false accusation, he launched a military mutiny with his mother, Empress Wei Zifu, aiming to kill Zhang Chong. With little other choice, an elderly Wu Di dispatched his imperial army to fight his son, with many thousands dying on the streets of Chang'an. In the end, Prince Zhu was defeated, and both he and his mother committed suicide. Wu Di was heartbroken by the death of his son, and in punishment, exterminated Zhang Chong's entire extended family. 
Over the next four years, the old emperor's health deteriorated rapidly, and on March 27, 87 BC, he managed to avoid civil war by appointing his eight-year-old son, Liu Fuling, as his heir apparent, by virtue of the fact he was related to neither the Wei or the Li. Two days later, he passed away at the age of 71. Emperor Wu of Han had reigned for 54 years. It was the longest tenure of any emperor in ancient Chinese history, a record that would not be broken until the reign of the Kangxi Emperor 1,800 years later. The impact that Han Wu Di had upon the history of the Middle Kingdom and its people cannot be understated. The teachings of Confucius became the principal form of social order in China for over 2,000 years, while also expanding to deeply influence the cultures of Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Thanks to the ardent centralization of his imperial government and his vast territorial conquests, the lands known to us today as China came to be seen less as a loose patchwork of kingdoms and cultures, but as a single people with regional varieties perhaps, but nevertheless bound by a shared Chinese identity. Was Han Wudi a cultural father who brought China into a golden age, or a ruthless conqueror whose endless ambition led to the destruction of cultures and the suffering of peoples both within and beyond his empire? It depends on who you ask, but either way, the mark he left on Chinese culture is one that is still felt today and always will be. We have more videos on Chinese history on the way, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.